papers situated here. Well, let me read through Genesis chapter 2, and uh, we'll look at it in more detail here. Genesis chapter 2 says, So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. By the seventh day, God completed his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from his work of creation. These are the records of the heavens and the earth concerning their creation at the time that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. No shrub of the field had yet grown on the land, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not made it rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. But water would come up out of the ground and water the entire surface of the land. Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. And the man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had formed. The Lord God caused to grow out of the ground every tree pleasing in appearance and good for food, including the tree of life in the middle of the garden, as well as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> a river went out from Eden to water the garden. From there it divided and became the source of four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon, which flows through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. Gold from that land is pure. Bdellium and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is Gihon, which flows through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris, which runs east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree of the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For on the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper as his complement. So the Lord God formed out of the ground every wild animal and every bird of the sky and brought each to the man to see what he would call it. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky and to every wild animal. But for the man, no helper was found as his complement. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs and closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This one at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Both the man and his wife were naked, yet felt no shame. Now, Genesis 2 is often picked on by secular or liberal theologians, saying that it is contradictory to Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to talk about that in a little more detail. But it is a further expansion on and a closer look at day 6 of creation, specifically the creation of man and the creation of Eden, and a little more details as to what takes place there, as we saw in the overview in chapter 1. Now here we get a very brief description of Eden, but a few things we want to point out is, one is that it was perfect. Sin was not yet in the world, and so everything there was perfect, morally perfect in every way. It is very difficult to imagine a world without sin. And we can imagine a good world, we can imagine a nice world, but try to imagine a world without sin, and it's very, very difficult to do. There's so many things that we're used to, so many things that we know that are there as a result of sin. The fact that we have doors and harsh weather, and the fact that we have police and fire departments, and the list goes on and on and on, they are all there directly or indirectly because of sin in the world. But as a matter of introduction, I want to go to Revelation chapter 21 and take a look at, this is a longer passage, but I think this is important to look at. Rather than looking back at what once was paradise, I want us to look forward to what will be paradise, and in many ways will even be better than the paradise of Eden. And we'll talk more about that in a minute, but Gen or Revelation rather 21 and I'll begin reading at verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea no longer existed. 
I also saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying, and pain will exist no longer because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. He also said, Write, because these words are faithful and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give water as a gift to the thirsty from the spring of life. The victor will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowards, unbelievers, vile, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls, filled with the seven last plagues, came and spoke with me. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Then he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed with God's glory. Her radiance was like a very precious stone, like a jasper stone, bright as crystal. The city had a massive high wall with twelve gates. Twelve angels were at the gates. The names of the twelve tribes of Israel's sons were inscribed on the gates. There were three great gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. The city wall had twelve foundations, and the twelve names of the Lamb's twelve apostles were on the foundations. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city was laid out in a square. Its length and width are the same. He measured the city with the rod at 12,000 stadia. Its length, width, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to human measurement, which the angel used. The building material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation, jasper, the second, sapphire, the third, chardonnay, the fourth, emerald, the fifth, sardonyx, the sixth, carnelian, the seventh, chrysolite, the eighth, beryl, the ninth, topaz, the tenth, chrysophase, the eleventh, jasnith, the twelfth, amethyst. The twelve gates are twelve pearls. Each individual gate was made of a single pearl. The broad street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. I did not see a sanctuary in it, because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its sanctuary. A city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because God's glory illuminates it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk in its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Each day its gates will never close because it will never be night there. They will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Nothing profane will ever enter it. No one who does what is vile or false, but only those written in the Lamb's book of life. Then he showed me the river of living water, sparkling like crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb and down the middle of the broad street of the city. The tree of life was on both sides of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations, and there will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his slaves will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will no longer exist, and people will not need lamplight or sunlight, because the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. A few things there real briefly. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that. That's a whole other sermon. But you see a lot of similarities, hopefully, between the beginning paradise and the end. But notice the description in the end is much more, there's much more detail there. We talk about precious stones and rivers in Eden. There's, there's better ones in the kingdom to come. We read in Genesis 3, which we're not quite there yet, that God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening. But in the end, in the New Jerusalem, God will live with us and we with him. And all of the evil will be gone. Now, why can this happen? It can happen because of Christ. It can happen because despite our sin and despite our wickedness and despite our rebellion, Christ is victorious. Our sin is great, but Christ's sacrifice was greater. And because of him, we can one day look forward to that. Not because of us, not because God owes us anything. If he owes us anything, it's an eternity in hell. But God has graciously chosen to grant us this paradise. So as we read about Eden today and we talk about Eden, may our focus not be on the past, but on the future, to what is coming, to what God has already promised us in his word, 
and the greatness of being with him in that paradise forever. So back to Genesis 2. Genesis 2 begins with the seventh day. Now it says here that God rested, that this does not imply that he was tired or he was out of energy, just that he was done. He was complete with his work. God does not get tired. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. No matter what he does or doesn't do, he never uh, runs out of energy, so to speak. And so it's not that kind of a rest, but it is a ceasing from the work of creation. It is also a, a model for us. So God created this pattern that we are to follow. If you think about all the ways we keep time, God set up, and we saw this in chapter 1, he set up the sun, he set up the moon, he set up the rotation of the earth, and that's how we tell days and months and years. But what about weeks? The week is rather arbitrary, aside from the scripture. But that's where we get the week from. We are to work six days, and we are to rest on the seventh. And even though the names of our days have changed over time, the fact that we still have seven days points back to this original creation. And God has set it up for us to work. Work is good, by the way. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. Uh, work is good, and we are to work, but we are also to rest. I want to look at just a couple scriptures here from the book of Exodus that speak about the Sabbath. We'll talk about this briefly as well. Exodus 23, verse 12. Moses tells the people, Do your work for six days, but rest on the seventh day so that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your female slave, as well as the foreign resident, may be refreshed. We were never designed to just work, 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 work. It is a very Western capitalistic idea to work, 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 to get everything done, to make as much money as we can. And when again, work is good. God created work, but rest is also good. A lot of us have trouble being idle. A lot of us have trouble just stopping and just focusing on God, but that's the way he set it up. That is the way he designed it for us. Exodus 31, another passage on this. Exodus 31, looking at verses 12 through 17, says, The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, You must observe my Sabbaths, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, so that you will know that I am Yahweh who sets you apart. Observe the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. Whoever profanes it must be put to death. If anyone does work on it, that person must be cut off from his people. Work may be done for six days, but on the seventh day, there must be a Sabbath of complete rest, dedicated to the Lord. Anyone who does work on the Sabbath day must be put to death. The Israelites must observe the Sabbath, celebrating it throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign forever between me and the Israelites. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, but on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. We need rest. We need physical rest, and we need spiritual rest. Now, without going into a long foray into church history, uh, it is no surprise to anyone, since we're all meeting here today, that we as Christians typically observe a Sabbath on Sunday. Now, Sunday is the first day of the week. Saturday is the traditional Sabbath day. But in the London Baptist Confession, it has a good way of summing up why we worship on Sunday and why we take a Sabbath. It says in chapter 22, verse 7 of that, it is the law of nature that in general, a portion of time specified by God should be set apart for the worship of God. So by his word and a positive moral and perpetual commandment that obligates everyone in every age, he has specifically appointed one day in seven for a Sabbath to be kept holy to him. From the beginning of the world to the resurrection of Christ, the appointed day was the last day of the week. After the resurrection of Christ, it was changed to the first day of the week, which is called the Lord's Day. This day is to be kept to the end of the age as the Christian Sabbath, since the observance of the last day of the week has been abolished. So we observe the Sabbath on Sunday. Now, I am old enough to remember when things would close on Sundays, and then they started closing earlier and it was like an hour earlier, and now there's not a whole lot of that anywhere. But even as a society, for many hundreds of years, we observed the Sabbath in some capacity or another. We don't do that so much anymore, but as Christians, we still do. We gather together, we stop. Rather than getting up and going to work, 
or to school on a Sunday morning, we come and we worship together. We take a break, and spiritually we are rested, hopefully, and we are refreshed as we gather together as the church. Interesting note about the Sabbath, going back to Genesis chapter 2 here again. This is the first thing that God declares to be holy. That is interesting to me. He says there in verse 3, God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy. So it was set apart. And the word holy is sanctify or to set apart or to be free from sin. And that's what the Sabbath is to be, is to be holy. It's a holy day, a separate day. It is not to be, kind of the opposite of that is ordinary. It's not to be an ordinary day where everything is just the same as every other day. And so God sets up that pattern for us right in the very beginning. Now moving on to verse 4 through 7 here, we have a description here of just kind of explaining what has already happened and what specifically is going to happen uh, on day 6. So it talks about uh, verse 5, no shrub of the field had yet grown on the land, no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not made it rain on the land, for there was no man to work the land. So here we have this description, kind of an overview, very, very quickly, just these couple of verses of the first three days of creation. Then we get to verse 7 and, and following. There is a, a focused-in look at day 6 in particular. Uh, verse 6, though, we don't want to skip over that. It says, water would come out, out of the ground and water the entire surface of the land. Now, we see a better picture of this when we look at the flood later on in Genesis. But we talked about the water above the earth. There was also water under the crust of the earth, water that would have been under tremendous pressure, and it would come forth, and it would water the land. So there was no need for the, the cycle of rain as we have it today. Uh, there was a much different system back then. Uh, moving on to verse 7 now, we get a, a clearer description of how God made man. Now remember how God made everything else. He spoke, and it was so. That's it. He spoke. He spoke the sun into existence. He spoke all the galaxies and stars into existence. He spoke the earth itself and light and every, all the stuff we looked at, he spoke. And yet with man, it was different. It says, the Lord God, verse 7, formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and the man became a living being. Now God didn't do that with the animals. God didn't do that with the plants. God didn't do that with the angels. But with man he took dirt from the earth and formed the man and then breathed into him. That shows that, that dual nature of who we are. We are both physical and yet we are spiritual as well. And we are the most like God, made in his image, out of everything else in creation. That gives us a better description of that. <clears throat> um, there are some plants that it said, and this was interesting too, since we're talking about the man. Uh, verse uh, 5, uh, there it says there's no man to work the ground. There were some plants that were necessary and needed cultivation from humanity. God designed it that way. So we see very early on that God, God designed work. He designed certain plants that needed to be worked by the man. Looking specifically here at Eden. Now, the whole earth, by the way, would have been a paradise by comparison to what we know today. The whole earth would have been magnificent, glorious. But Eden was special. Eden was even more special, even more glorious, even more amazing than the rest of the earth would have been. In fact, if you look at Scripture... You can see many different types of earths. We'll look at this real, real quickly here. But you have this earth in the beginning. That was free from sin. That was this marvelous paradise with Eden at its center. And everything good and great was there. You have earth after sin and before the flood. That still would have been pretty good. Still would have been really nice. Still would have had that protection of water above the water that came up out of the earth afterwards. But not quite as good. We'll talk more about that next week. Uh, then you had earth after the flood until the end. That's where we are right now. There's some good things on this earth, some beautiful places on earth, beautiful mountains and jungles and forests and deserts and all sorts of interesting things, but not quite as good as it used to be. And then we have the earth we just read about in Revelation, that future earth, where everything will be better even than it was in Eden. But Eden sounds pretty good. 
So God plants this garden in Eden. By the way, the names and descriptions of all of these places here are not the same names and descriptions we read about later. Now, why do I say that? Because of the flood. So the earth was completely and totally destroyed and devastated by the flood. We'll look at that in more detail later. So then it uses some of these names that we are familiar with from well, the world today or even later in Scripture. Names like the rivers, the Tigris, the Euphrates, places like Cush, Assyria. Uh, those are not the same places as we read about today. Uh, the earth was radically destroyed. So think of it like this. Ken Ham describes it this way. I thought this was a pretty good way to imagine it. Uh, well, I live in Norfolk, but when most of the time, and this happens probably once a month at the rescue mission, someone will call and ask for directions or say they're going to drop something off, and they're confused, and we're confused, and we figure out they're actually in Norfolk, Virginia. This happens a lot, because Norfolk, even though it was not originally supposed to be called Norfolk, that's a whole other story, uh, but it shares the same name with Norfolk, Virginia. But Norfolk, Virginia, that's not the original Norfolk either, because there's a Norfolk in England as well. So people move, they travel, and uh, Europeans came over here, and they go, I don't know, this, this kind of reminds me of Norfolk, or this kind of reminds me of whatever. And so they name things from what they're used to. So this was pre-flood earth. So Noah and his sons get off the boat, and they go, I don't know, this kind of reminds me of the Tigris. What do you think? Yeah, why not? This reminds me of the Euphrates. That kind of, this kind of looks like Assyria, don't you think? Well, sure. They renamed everything after the flood. So the idea that Eden would have been in the Middle East, we have no idea where Eden was. Eden could be at the bottom of the ocean. Eden could be in Antarctica. We don't know where Eden was. Uh, just because of some of the names here are places in the Middle East today does not mean that's where it is. The name Eden, though, means delight, and it certainly was a delight, this beautiful garden. Trees all over the place and fruit trees that they could freely eat from. And there was also two very special trees. Uh, notice in uh, Genesis 2 it says there was a tree of life in the center of the garden. But Revelation tells us there was many trees of life there. So there was even more of them at that time. So they were allowed to eat from all the trees, including the tree of life. Uh, but there was also another tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. These were real, literal, physical trees. They do not exist today. It was not an apple tree. We can blame Renaissance-era artists for our idea that Adam and Eve ate an apple, and that's what caused them to sin. It's some fruit that doesn't exist anymore, because there is no more a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That, along with the tree of life and all of Eden, would have been completely destroyed in the flood. But there were l real, literal trees that were there, and God told them, yes, you can eat from all these, but do not eat from this one. We'll get back to that in just a minute. It describes this river, this beautiful river that would have split into four parts. It describes these different lands. It talks about all the gold that was there. It also talks about bdellium, and I don't know if I'm even saying that right, but uh, that is some kind of something they use for an incense or a resin. Uh, some people think it was, uh, could have been what was in myrrh. I don't know enough about this stuff. I'm just going to say, okay, that sounds good to me. Also onyx. Uh, onyx is a beautiful stone. So it was just this beautiful land with an abundance of natural resources that was there. And again, I thought it's interesting, they talk about gold being in the land, and the gold from that land is good, and then we see the description in Revelation, gold in the land, our streets are made of gold. I mean, that was even better. Everything in the New Jerusalem is better than what we read about in Eden. All right, God gives different commands to Adam and eventually Eve, but she's not there quite yet. Uh, verses 15 through 20, he is told to work the garden. So here the doctrine of work is created. This comes up an awful lot, uh, if you can imagine this, at the rescue mission. We talk about work. Work is not a curse. Work is not bad. Work is not a sin. The uh, kind of American ideal of striking it rich and kicking back and doing nothing, that's not good. We're designed to work. We're designed to do things. That's how God made us. If you've ever been on a long vacation or been out of work due to sickness or injury or whatever, Usually after a week or two, you're, you're about ready to go back to work again. That's just, that's, that's how we're made. And that's a good thing. God made us that way. So God gives a command to Adam, I want you to work the garden. Now what did that mean exactly? There's no thorns. There's no thistles. There's no weeds. There's no nothing bad. He just goes around and enjoys it. Keeps it looking nice and 
eats the fruit. I mean, that would have been a pretty good job. He's also commanded to keep the garden, to watch over it as well. And he was told to eat the fruit. That was to be his food, all the fruit, except for, of course, the one. Then he was given one more command. He said, Adam, I want you to name the animals. Now here we have to stop for just a minute and uh, look at what kind of animals there would have been at that time. We talked about this uh, briefly last time, but there is all the kinds of animals. So you look at all the dogs today. There wasn't every little subspecies of dog at that time. There was just two of the dog kind, two of the cat kind, two of the horse kind, et cetera, et cetera. So we're looking at maybe hundreds of animals, not millions of every little subspecies, and he's not naming them in the Latin and all the stuff how we categorize them today. We don't know what Adam named the animals. In fact, we don't even know what language Adam spoke. Uh, but at that time, up until sometime in the future, at least till the Tower of Babel anyway, whatever Adam named the animals, that was what they were called. So what does this show us? shows us a, a number of things about Adam, which is important. Number one, that he had great intelligence, that God made him and kind of pre-programmed him with the intelligence to reason out and to look at the animals, to realize that he was different, and then to give them names appropriate to themselves. Also, it showed that language was there from the very beginning. Never in human history has there been cavemen that grunted each other and tried to communicate in some animal-like fashion. We read in Scripture that from the very beginning, humans were able to speak, and they were able to speak intelligently. They were able to speak to each other, and were able to, most importantly, I would say, speak and converse with God. So God gave us language so that we can talk to him, and he can talk to us, and it makes sense, and we can read about it right here in his word. Verse 18 is the first time that God says something is not good. He said it is not good for the man to be alone. This does not mean sinful in this case. It's more of along the lines of this is not complete. It is not yet done. There is more to come from or for humanity here. So now we move on to the creation of woman and the creation of marriage. Three institutions that God started and that God ordained. The first one we read here is marriage and the family. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute. Second is that of government, human government that God set up, not a specific type of government, but we read about that in Genesis chapter 9. And then the church that was ordained much later. But this is the first and the most important one is that of marriage and the family. Well, before we get to that, Adam was able to reason as he was naming the animals that no animal was equal to him. Uh, people are superior to pets. This may come as a shock to a lot of people today that carry their dogs with them in the grocery carts and all those things. Now, I like pets, don't get me wrong. Dogs and cats and other, we have a rabbit at home. I don't know why, but we do. And <laughs> pets are good, I like pets, but pets are not superior to people. Humanity is superior. Out of all of God's creation, God made humanity special. So he created Adam, and even Adam realized right off the bat, yeah, I, I, don't, I can't connect with this cat. I can't connect with this dog. I can't. That's just not the same. And of course, God knew that. God was aware of that. And so God created the woman. What's interesting is how God created the woman. It was different from how God created the man, and again, different from how God created everything else. God performs the first surgery, so to speak. He has Adam put to a deep sleep. And as Adam is asleep, most translations say he took a rib from his side, but he took some living part of Adam. So you get the idea of the rib, the flesh, and then made Eve from that. And it's interesting, too, that he, she came from Adam's side. So they were to be helpmeets in one part of another. They were to be equal in that way, different in roles. There are definitely different roles biblically, for men and women, we'll look at that more next week, uh, but they are, they are together. So the man is not complete without the woman. The woman is not complete without the man, and the two of them go together. Uh, the very first and only recorded words of humanity pre-fall are here in verse 23. Now, I'm sure they said other things, but the only recorded words that were said is what Adam says about Eve here in verse 23. He says, this one, at last, is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. 
This one will be called woman, for she was taken from man. So he sees this special creation from God, that of the woman. And it's interesting, too, that the first woman came from man, but then every other man came from woman. So at this very first time, it came, she came from man. And they recognized that they were equal. Eve, as well, would have been pre-programmed, for lack of a better term, just as Adam was with the intelligence, the ability to speak. They would have been created as fully formed adults. We talked about that last week as well. Uh, she was the perfect companion to Adam in every way. He was specifically created for him. That's an interesting thing to think about there. And we don't know much about what their relationship was like before sin. We'll talk about this more next week too, but I do not think they were in the garden very long before sin came into the picture. But they would have had the perfect relationship. They should have had the perfect marriage. Everything should have been great. But then sin comes in. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's look at marriage here and the importance of marriage. Um, verse 24 says, and it very simply, this is why a man leaves his father and mother and bonds with his wife, and they become one flesh. Jesus expands on this just a little. If we go to Mark uh, chapter 10, we'll see uh, that Jesus explains this just a little more detail here. Okay, Mark 10, verses 6 through 9. Uh, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. There is a lot of important doctrines in here. So number one, right off the bat, it's male and female. It's not male and male. It's not female and female. It's not some other bizarro combination out there. It is one man, and it is one woman. And they are starting their own new family. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother. It doesn't mean he rejects them. It doesn't mean he ignores them. It doesn't mean he does not honor his parents any longer. But it means he leaves them to start his own family. And that's what marriage is all about. A man will leave his father and mother, and then it says to be joined to his wife. They are to be joined together in marriage. And there's a permanence there. It says they are no longer two, but one flesh. We are designed to be together. We are not complete without our spouse. That is the way that God made us. That is the way that God created us. Now, I realize that sin comes into the picture, and through death and divorce or abandonment or any number of sinful things that happen uh, it doesn't always work out the way it's supposed to but the way it's supposed to is this one man and one woman for life and therefore verse 9 what God has joined together man must not separate uh, that's a whole other sermon on divorce and things like that but it was meant to be permanent that's the point we want to make today so God creates this human institution he creates the family specifically creates Adam, specifically creates Eve, and unites them together in marriage. And then shortly after that, they begin to have children, but we'll get into that later as well. So marriage is a very important thing. Uh, the last verse here says, both the man and his wife were naked yet felt no shame. Remember the first thing they did after they sinned? They covered themselves. Because they, they realize their guilt, they realize their shame. But here, the text is telling us that there was no shame. There was no guilt. There was no sin. Everything was as it should be. God had created it all perfect, and it was perfect. And Adam and Eve together, in marriage, was perfect. Boy, we have a big problem in our society today regarding marriage. Marriage is being thrown out the window. Marriage is being redefined, claiming that two men can get married or two women can get married. It's not long before polygamy is legal or any number of other abominations. But God is very, very clear in his word what marriage is and what marriage is not. And it's often easy for us to look at the more extreme examples and say, oh, how terrible that is. Uh, the homosexual marriage and the, the group marriage and all these weird things they're trying to do. But any thing, aside from God's standard here in the text, is an abomination. 
Fornication before marriage is an abomination. It is not the way God designed marriage to be. Adultery is an abomination. It's not the way God designed things to be. God designed it specifically. So we as Christians especially have to fight for marriage. We have to stand up and, and declare how important marriage is. It is the fundamental building block of civilization. If a marriage is destroyed, a family is destroyed. My parents divorced when I was a kid. Many of you have experienced divorce at one time or another. It is all too common, even in the church. And it still, to this day, I deal with the effects of that. My kids still deal with the effects of that. And it goes on and on and on. Divorce is a terrible, terrible thing. So as the church, we must fight for marriage. We must stand up and declare that anything that is opposed to God's plan for marriage is wrong. We cannot slide into society and say, well, it's okay. If two people love each other, who am I to judge? How, how's that going to affect me? And we, we can't be okay with fornication. We can't be okay with adultery. We cannot be okay with homosexual relationships. It is all sinful. It is all wrong, and it all goes against God's standard. We'll close with one verse out of Hebrews here. Hebrews chapter 13 In verse 4, it says, Marriage must be respected by all, and the marriage bed kept undefiled, because God will judge immoral people and adulterers. You know, there's no expiration date on God's word. If he says it, he means it. He says it thousands of years ago at creation with Adam and Eve, he means it still today. Marriage is important, and as the church, we must fight for marriage. We must stand up and declare if God's word says this is the way it is, this is the way it is. The world can do what the world does, and that's sinful defiance of God's word, but we as the church need to stand for what's right. And we need to be a light for what is right. And we, need, we don't need to go out there and, and tell the unsaved world to change this and do that. We need to go out and tell the unsaved world they need to be saved. They need Jesus. Because if we go out there and we got rid of gay marriage and we got rid of adultery and we changed all these laws, but all these people died and went to hell anyway, then what's the point? So our mandate as the church is to proclaim the gospel. Because as good as Eden was, the new Jerusalem is better. And that's what we have to look forward to as Christians. And so we must stand up for what God has said. We must wholeheartedly respect what the Bible teaches on this. And we must proclaim the gospel to those that need to hear it. And the gospel is a wonderful thing. We would all be hopelessly lost without Christ. I don't know where all of you stand today. I would assume that most of you are believers. But I know there's people that watch online, and maybe you're a visitor here today. But I want to implore you that salvation is for all. If you have sinned, if you have violated God's word, in any way, shape, or form, the Bible tells us we are headed for hell. But God in his mercy came to this earth as a man, and Jesus lived a perfect life. All the law that we read about in the Old Testament, Jesus fulfilled perfectly for us. And then he died. The one person that shouldn't die died for all of us that should have died. Jesus took our place. And Jesus' sacrifice for us on the cross and his resurrection three days later made it possible for us to go to that paradise again. So I implore you, if you are not right with God, pray to him today. Talk to him today. He is ready and waiting and willing to accept you into his family. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you teach us and tell us in the book of Genesis. There's so many fundamental truths very early on here. As we looked at the topic of marriage, marriage is very much under attack in our society today. Rather, it's from adultery or divorce or fornication or homosexuality or anything else. We have strayed far from what your word has taught us about marriage and what your word has taught us about you. Lord, may we go back to your word. May we read what it says. May we wholeheartedly obey you. And may we go out to a lost and dying world and tell them that there is hope, that there is salvation found only in you. In your name we pray.